okay, well, you are in the right place, I'm assuming, since you've seen this up here. Um, experiments in augmented and virtual experiences at the American Museum of Natural History. Is the future here? Hmm. Nope. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the future. I am Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you very much. Matter of fact, this is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Huh? Surprise. <laughs> Don't know where to take that one. I didn't put our names. Sorry. Sorry. This is Vivian. She can introduce herself. Sorry. Oh, okay. So I'm Vivian Trapinski. Oh, crap. I know you were supposed to go first. I'm sorry. We haven't, uh, we haven't practiced very much, but it's like fine. four times. So I'm Matt, uh, Matt Tarr, Museum of Natural History. Uh, I'm a little fatigued. This is like my third session, and it's the last day, so I'll forgive you all for being here, but um, the, uh, I've been at the museum for 17 years, uh, one week shorter than her, but she might cover that. Uh, I started as a programmer and have been there for, uh, since that time, and now I'm the director of digital architecture, which you probably heard me describe earlier this week. My interest is in experience as it crosses many channels. How about that? Great. And now um, I am director of data visualization or science visualization at the museum which uh, is a far cry from my role as a film producer. So I started there um, 18 years ago nearly, one week before mm -hmm. Matt, um, to create short documentaries about current science going on all over the world as a means of communicating current research and current science content in some of our permanent halls. That was our big digital strategy at the time. Um, and that went on for a long time and it was a great gig. I got to go places like here, I'm in Antarctica on the way to the South Pole in 2001. Um, but in recent years, we began to really explore and study our visitor behavior in our permanent halls, and we were seeing that visitors are just not as interested in video as they were 10, 15 years ago. And it's no surprise, because they've got those nice 4K TVs and comfortable couches at home, and they don't need to come to the museum to watch TV. So um, what we're doing now is experimenting with new ways of infusing our permanent halls with current science across different interactive platforms including AR and VR. So why would you listen to us talk about AR and VR? Vivian has a great spiel about this. <laughs> yes, this is my spiel. Um, everything now is pixels. So scientists and artists and filmmakers and game designers are all working in the same medium. And so for me, as a, as a professional working in this sphere of communicating science to general audiences, it's an amazing, amazing opportunity because we don't have to sort of find new ways of communicating science um, and representing scientific products <laughs> to our audiences. We can actually leverage these authentic artifacts of science. Um, scientists are generating huge data sets now in the course of their research, and they're visualizing those data sets in the course of their discovery process. And we can work with them to leverage those data sets and put them in all sorts of amazing three-dimensional and interactive environments to give our visitors access to those artifacts. It's as if, you know, suddenly we had a million dinosaur bones to hand out to every visitor who came through the door. Um, so that's sort of the premise of our strategy of thinking about incorporating AR and VR into the museum. And then I put this little note here, it's sort of shorthand for me, I, I say this all the time about uh, visitors show up with expectations, right? And we need to understand what those expectations are. So some of this is about us exploring VR and AR just as it's going to become uh, up, coming up through the zeitgeist, you know. So VR at AM&H. So of course, we've been at this since 1869, um, the founding of our institution. Uh, the very first virtual reality installation was the dioramas. I like to I talk about this a lot. This is not the, I don't think this was in 1909, but it is like almost 270 degrees wrap around. You can stand in it, and it literally fills your entire field of view. Um, it was a different kind of technology. It was uh, taxidermy, a new kind of taxidermy by, you know, developed by Akeley, but also all kinds of uh, art artisans, uh, artisanship and things like that, painting and uh, model making and um, traveling great distances with uh, sketch artists and painters and things like that. Um, and then we, the museum has taken that another level by, by designing halls to be immersive experiences. And this is our iconic Hall of Ocean Life with the iconic blue whale. Um, and visitors come there and they, you know, they just hang out under the whale. They just hang out in this sort of oceany, atmospheric it, yeah. hall. Um, it feels like you're in the ocean. It's, it's yeah. Um, and, and, it, and it's a massive space, massive space. But let's go bigger. Let's yes. go all the way. So in the 30s, 
the museum built the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, planetariums are an old form. I think they go back to ancient Greece. And certainly since the 1700s, people have been using them as a, an environment in which to educate people about the stars. Um, and so basically, uh, the Hayden opened to the public in 1935, and that's the Zeiss Starball Projector. So it would project a 2D um, image of the night sky, which then you could overlay graphics onto and talk about the constellations. Um, and that's what people came to see. So it was really, really immersive, but fairly static. Next comes digital projection. And right. So in 2000, we opened the new Hayden Planetarium um, in the Rose Center for Earth and Space. And this was one of the first multi-projector planetariums where we could leverage data visualization to immerse people in the entire universe and across time. So what you're looking at here is a scene from our current show, um, Dark Universe. And those black tendrils are dark matter. The light blobs are um, clusters of galaxies held together by the gravity of the dark matter. And we actually showed a simulation of 14 billion years of evolutionary history, of the evolution of structure in the universe. That's the kind of work that scientists are doing now, that we can immerse our visitors in, um, in this environment. And the cool thing is that through visitor surveys, we know that visitors um, feel like this is a transportive, immersive environment. They talk about feeling like they're flying through space. Um, and many of them think that we're showing them a 3D projection, even though we're not. It's really just a factor of the curved space um, and then the parallax of the camera within that space. So you don't necessarily need um, a virtual reality environment to, to enable your visitors to have that experience. So th this is pre-rendered, but the next step is really... Right, so now we're going for interactive. We're going for large, immersive, interactive data visualizations. This is a shot um, representing our open space project, which is a project that we're developing with three university pro uh, partners, NYU, uh, uh, University of Utah Science Computing and Imaging Institute, and Linköping University in Sweden. And what we're trying to do is to build, and we are doing it, uh, to build a, a real-time um, platform for engagement with large Earth and space science data sets. And so the idea here um, is that we're taking this sort of the notion of immersion one step further to be real time and engagement with large audiences. This is our Breakfast at Pluto event. This was July 14th, 2015. Um, if any of you remember, the New Horizons spacecraft had its close encounter with Pluto. And this was seven in the morning in our Lefrac Theater. Over 400 people showed up. And we were joined by 10 other institutions around the world. Every continent was represented except for Antarctica. People were in planetarium domes and 3D theaters. Um, a guy in Ghana was in a homemade dome that he built by himself. And we were also joined by the uh, mission team. They were at the Applied Physics Laboratory um, at Johns Hopkins. And they were sort of coming in and commenting live about what we were seeing. Because we were seeing, through the magic of visualization, what this spacecraft was doing four and a half billion miles from Earth at the time of that close encounter. And Neil Tyson did show up to that one, so, so he's there. Conveniently. So I hope it's clear. So this was in the IMAX theater, which is less immersive, although IMAX is obviously immersive, but uh, domes and VR headsets all could be connected up through this network system to create these, these massive network environments of, of immersion. Um, here's a quick sample of some work. Yeah, so, so we did take some of these data sets, put them in VR environments, and this is the surface of Mars. Um, the data is six meter resolution data, so about the size of a two car garage. Um, it's data collected by the CTX camera from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it, we have even higher resolution data from, from um, some instruments from the rovers. And we're visualizing the sort of rover tracks on Mars. And we could put somebody in a virtual reality headset um, and they could walk across Mars. And it's very cool, um, but it is a little bit lonely because you're there by yourself. So, uh, so that's on the content side. There's also a big um, challenge, obviously, about how you leverage virtual reality in a public space. So we've been doing some experiments with our own content, but also with other people's content. This is content from um, 
weavers. It's called the Blue. And we, we set up a little pop-up VR station in our Hall of Ocean Life. We're back in Hall of Ocean Life. And uh, we projected the live playback onto a large screen that's there, thinking, so mm -hmm. even if individuals are using the VR headsets, we could draw in, A, their social group can watch as they're doing it, but also we can draw other visitors uh, into the hall, give them something to look at. Um, and it really did work. And people were engaged here, engaging with a virtual whale under a model of a whale in a virtual environment in a hall that's built to be the environment. So it's a little bit meta, but people really seemed uh, to enjoy it. And we moved people through fairly quickly. So for a two minute experience, we could get somebody in that headset, clean it off, put on a little gauze thing um, within about four minutes. For a six minute uh, experience, we got people through every eight minutes, but that was with two visitor service people. So it's quite an investment um, in, in people power um, to make this stuff work in the hall. We also, we were curious to know if people would pay for this experience. If we want to do it in the future, we have to know if it's going to be a, a, an economic model for us. And so uh, through visitor surveys, we found out that people would be happy to pay five to $10 for that kind of experience. And then finally, this, uh, this is a VR prototype that we did uh, in about four weeks as part of our insect day prototyping. So we're gonna have a, a new insect hall in a new building that we're, we're building that's gonna be open in late 2020. And we, we tested all sorts of hands-on activities and microscopes and meet the scientists. Um, and as one of those activities, we created a VR experience in which we took CT scan data of a weevil um, from one of our scientists, Steve Davis, and put it into a VR environment in which you can shrink down to the size of a weevil, you can open up its wings, and we decided to target this with a very specific educational focus, and that was to ask how do insects breathe? Because insects, it turns out, don't have lungs, but they have holes in their sides and these really cool breathing tubes, um, which you can see on these CT scans. And, and one, one of the questions that comes up for me is, that, so this is all data visualization. Uh, the background and the trees and things like that is all artistic. So it was to give it a context and, and, and wrap it in the experience. Yeah, and kids loved it. Kids, um, they waited online for 20 to 30 minutes to do this experience, which was about a two minute, 20 second experience. And they didn't complain afterwards. Kids really enjoyed it. Um, so that is food for thought, however, this is a typical day at the museum, so try running them through. Yeah, so uh, I think we all agree at the museum. We're really intrigued by VR. We can put meaningful content into a VR environment. We can create meaningful and educational experiences um, in the, that environment. But uh, for an institution that has about five million people through the door every day, it's really just not practical right now. Mm. So the other half of the topic uh, is augmented reality, which of course we've been doing since 1869. Um, here's an early example. Um, it's a little hard to see. Let me, I got another, a better picture of it. So there you can see with the uh, annotations overlaid over the images. You have to kind of like move your head a little bit, but um, so fine. How about if we put the object in its original context? Or what if we put an illustration uh, and hover it over the specimen so that you can really see what's underneath the shell? Um, all right, fine, whatever. 2011, we released our first uh, augmented reality app. It was just a way to explore the space um, probes and, and vehicles from a show called Beyond Planet Earth. Uh, a couple years later, we made you into a bear and or a dinosaur, and you explored the museum. Uh, in, the, in this case, you explored the North American Mammals Hall to uh, discover your bear superpowers by sort of clicking on different parts of a diorama. Um, and then with, in, in, in working with Google, we uh, at the launch of, well, the I.O. launch of their Tango product, we um, unleashed Dinosaurs Among Us um, 3D models into the universe, uh, which actually, this gets tremendously positive reviews, even though there's like five Tango devices in the world. All, um, all five people love all it. <laughs> all five Tango owners love this. Uh, with the one exception, the one complaint is that there's no T-Rex in it because there was no T-Rex in the show. 
Uh, but, but what about the objects, Vivian always asks me. Yes, I say, what about the objects, Matt? Um, so again, my purview at the museum is, is how do we keep our, our permanent halls relevant? How do we infuse them with current science? How do we tell our visitors that science is still going on? Um, and so this is our hall of biodiversity. It's got over 1,500 models and specimens in it. Um, and all of those specimens, specimens come from our collections. And so those are Lots our collections. Of collections. We have over 33 million physical objects yeah. in our collections. Um, and let us remind ourselves here, this community of museum people, that collections are at the core of what a museum is, right? We, we collect objects and then we exhibit them in order to share them with the world. And no digital technology is gonna obviate that mission. So, so our challenge is, as, as Matt was saying at the beginning, people come in with this interest in digital technology. It's an opportunity to use it to engage them in these objects. So, th so that's what we're strategizing for. But additionally, coming from a science institution, um, our, our collections now are not just physical objects, they are digital objects. Because our scientists are using all sorts of imaging techniques, fluorescence imaging, um, CT scans, which is tomographic x-rays, um, scanning electron microscopes, microscopes to image objects in nature and to try and understand more about them um, on scales that are just too small to see, um, it allows them to scan specimens um, and study them without destroying them. We can use um, modeling and simulation techniques to try and understand the behavior of extinct animals. And these objects are extremely compelling mm -hmm. and really important um, artifacts of science. In fact, I was talking to one of our scientists um, about my spiel. And I was saying, you know, when I talk about your work, I talk about artifacts of science. Are you comfortable with that terminology? Is that a fair representation to say what these things are? And he said, well, actually, we describe them as specimens. We consider them to be as primary and as important as the physical specimen they were derived from. And to me, that was just like an aha moment. That puts the burden on us as modern museum professionals to find a way of bringing these specimens out to the visitors. They're objects that we need to display. And so that's, that's really, um, it's not just an opportunity, but I think it's a responsibility. And I assume that art museums have similar um, challenges in displaying natively digital works of art to their audiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this, um, we're just gonna tell you about one little prototype we did. This is uh, derived from CT scan data of a mako shark that two of our scientists created, um, and then our 3D artist uh, put this in Maya and smoothed it out and made something very beautiful from it. We took that scan and we lev leveraged it across a bunch of platforms because we're interested in the experience, not just the technology. So we wanna, we, we wanna try it in a lot of different ways. So there, that's the Google Tango. That's one of the five that's available. Um, and this is in our Hall of Biodiversity where there is a mako shark hanging from the ceiling. So through the Tango, you can see inside that shark. You can touch it and, and, and animate it interactively. And then we took that same data set, that same model, and put it into a Microsoft HoloLens. And there, at first, we did try uh, to use gesture um, interaction with it, but, but visitors found that very hard um, to replicate. So we turned it into voice commands. And we found that visitors really loved uh, bossing around a shark and telling it what to do. It's like having a really obedient dog. It's very, it's very satisfying. And there are learning opportunities. The Mako is the fastest shark in the ocean. So we can talk about how it swims. It also has these amazingly bizarre jaws that unhinge like grandpa's fa false teeth. Um, and they open really wide so that the Mako can inhale a lot of prey. So there are a lot of opportunities to say interesting things. And it's worth noting that we only know about those interesting things, not inherent in the data, but from working with our scientists who can point them out to us and talk about the things that they're using the data for. So it is the future here. I hope we've come to a conclusion together. Um, yes, well, sort of. This quote is, this is one of my favorite quotes, but I think what, what we were sort of realizing when we came to this is that, and, and sort of that, not that, it's not a joke, but like running through the AR and VR that we've been doing all along is, is really that um, 
if you guys saw Nick uh, the other day talking about this, it's like this is, this is new in some ways and not new in other ways, right? Like it really is. It's just a new technology. There are a lot of interesting new affordances. Uh, but the future's always been here, right? Like uh, Akeley had to invent technology to make the Hall of North American Mammals and then go off to the field to do whatever he did there. Um, or was it the other way around? Anyway, um, so, yeah, yeah we think. Yeah, we, the thing that I was thinking about this afternoon was like, yeah, the future's always here, but it's always running. And it's just mm -hmm. a matter mm -hmm. of how fast, how much energy you want to expend running after it. Because right. it's always going to keep on going. Um, so it's always just ahead of you. But, but keeping the focus on, you know, like your, like your point, like real data, what can it do? What can, you know, what can we teach a kid about a, a shark that this technology actually uses as opposed to just like labeling the shark's parts in virtual environments or, or whatever? Um, so, so what do we know? So we didn't, you know, we, we sort of hinted at the beginning of, um, or the description, I should say, that we had a lot of questions. And we have a few answers, not all the answers, but um, we do know this stuff is super cool and it's a great way to communicate science. Uh, we know that people love the stuff. When we go down into the halls with something that looks sort of futuristic, uh, people will line up to take a turn even though they have no idea what they're waiting for. Um, but we did find that the um, more sophisticated the platform, the higher the expectation. I think basically what, what visitors expect is that if you have this futuristic looking device, it's going to be utterly transparent. And if, if they're going to get hung up on trying to give the proper you know, gesture command, mm -hmm. if it's not going to work properly, if there's a lag in, in response time, it's really going to disappoint your visitors. But, but is it the opposite of that, that if you handed them like Tango, they're just kind of like, oh, yeah, it's like a phone, but Tango's bigger. somewhere in the middle. But yeah. if, if they come across a kiosk, they'll just right. bang Smash on it on until it. it breaks. And then so this is, this is the point that you've made to me a yeah. lot of times, which is the scaffolding. Mm -hmm. Yes, don't neglect the scaffolding. And it goes back to what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. This stuff is like any other museum, exhibition, or educational opportunity. Um, you need to think about what you're trying to communicate. You need to think about how to use words, how to use designs in order to words. communicate a message, a lesson. Um, just because it's cool doesn't mean that it does that work for you. Mm -hmm. And, and, well, and this is the idea that it's totally possible. I mean, you did it in four weeks, of course. So you have a very talented team, and that's not true for anybody else, right? But Right. Um, yeah. You know, when I... You start small. Yeah. Learn a lot. And there's no reason for everybody to cut their teeth on it. I mean, people can wait to leverage the experience that other people with more um, opportunity to prototype and, and, and experiment um, can share. Yeah. This is something we talk about all the time, though, and it's it just reinforced here, is that the content drives the experience, drives the technology, not the other way around. If you're flipping it around, you get at, at best chasing your tail, at worst wasting time and money, right? Um, so so what now? Where do we go from here? Um, well, here's a, sort of where we stand. Um, um, things to watch for. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of virtual reality, we really do think that room scale experiences are coming how large those rooms will be, how many people will they accommodate, we don't know, but it goes hand in hand with um, networked experiences. We're going to have groups, it, and it's starting to happen, that are untethered, that's a big thing, um, that can share a virtual space um, using headsets, using laptops, using all sorts of um, haptic technology. Mm -hmm. It is coming, and so, if you think now about the content that you want to communicate, by the time it comes and is ready for our one million, two million, or five million visitors, we'll be able to create some really amazing stuff, I think. And then this is just like a little cheat sheet of words, like, you know, when you're reading articles, look for these things. Inside out tracking means you don't need a room set up special. It, you know, FOV is how wide of a field of view it is and how immersive. And resolution is just, you know, how obviously how tiny the pixels are. And that, that's that barn door thing. Um, also, I didn't put on here, but like a refresh rate, really critical, that kind of stuff. So pay attention to those things. Those are the changes that matter, not the color of the headset. Uh, AR, of course, shows a lot of promise, as you all probably <coughs> guessed. It really does continue this long, you know, tradition, not really true, purpose, function of museums, which is to layer these stories on top of the, the exhibits and the content and the objects. Um, and, and we're, we're yeah. waiting for wearables. We think we're betting on them quite frankly, because now you can do AR on your phone. Um, it's limiting, right? You, 
Yeah, exactly. And we can hand out <laughs> we can hand out some tangos and some headsets in the museum, but um, we are betting with a large uh, sector of the technology field mm. on smart glasses coming back, on people walking in with their own wearable technologies, and that's when we could really make augmented reality a part, a seamless part of their visit to the museum. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that. And meanwhile, AR Core and AR Kit uh, are, are things to watch out for, and these are just really the software that's embedded in iOS and Android that's going to power the, the mainstreaming of this idea of sort of simple phone-based AR. And so we'll see whether that you know makes it uh, really easy to pick up. But speaking of easy to pick up, these guys, Sketchfab, if you download their app, you can actually do right now. They, they've been, they've added AR Core and AR Kit to their app. You can just search for 10,000 different models, drop them on the floor. So you don't have to do anything. If you really just want to play with AR in your space, go find a T-Rex or go find a whatever and drop it on the floor and do some, do some testing with, with people to see their interest. And poly.google.com is, uh, from what I can tell, a week ago they launched that and it basically just copies what Sketchfab is and does the same thing. And one last thing you know, that I'll mention is you can reach out to these technology partners, these industries that are uh, groups that are making the technology because they're really interested in knowing how it mm. can be used mm -hmm. in educational um, programming and in large public institutions. It's really important for them. And if you do that, if we all reach out to them early, then we can impact the way this technology is developed to make sure that it supports our audiences. Yeah. I mean, actually, that's how we, we ended up with the HoloLens was through partnership with Microsoft. So, um, so epilogue, risk rewards. So just tremendous risk, right? We're going to put ourselves out of business. If these virtual environments are going to be so immersive and amazing that nobody's going to ever come to the museum. Yeah, and we think that that's a load of crap. People are going to want to get out of the house occasionally. They're going to change out of their pajamas and go meet their friends. Um, and if we keep doing our jobs well, people will always come to the museums um, to see unusual things at unusual scales and to have social experiences. But we do think that there is a real opportunity in creating virtual museum environments. And so we just wanted to share with you a, a, a quick project that we put together to inform ourselves about a redesign that we're doing in our hall of planet Earth. We're redesigning some sections um, of the hall. We're going to be incorporating a lot of media, but we were really concerned about the scale um, of doing this refresh versus other parts of the hall and what would the visitor experience be and what would the light bounce be and so on. And so uh, really in, a, in about a week, um, with the help of a couple interns, we built our hall in virtual reality and using a, a Vive headset. We put in the designs that we were working on um, and we allowed ourselves to tour the hall in virtual reality. And it really did inform some of our decision making. We saw that some of the designs that we were really excited about were way too busy, um, didn't work with the sight lines that would be available to the visitors, and just really didn't make sense in the physical um, <coughs> reality of the hall. So we think that this is a real opportunity uh, for all of us as exhibition designers um, to work through our designs beforehand. It will be a really valuable tool. Thanks. Anybody quit? Just two minutes. Anybody in the back? Uh, uh, briefly, I will say that I believe that the complaints about HoloLens are overblown. It is mind-blowingly amazing. It's just a small window. It, it, it's incredible in that window, and it's like complaining about, you know, air travel, you know, or whatever. Yeah, but, we were surprised you know. that visitors didn't complain about the window. We couldn't do some things we wanted to do. So we had to position the Make shark that it, so it was kind of in front of you. We couldn't put it up on the ceiling because you would only have sort of a slice of it in that window. But I have heard, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. first I heard that Microsoft had no plans to widen the window. And then I heard that they were, actually. Sure. I don't know if you have any. I mean, that's, they're working on it. I think it's the, it's the photon entanglement only works from a certain sort of angle. So this is the same thing that Magic Leap is working on, right? They're wider angle, it's the same thing. Yes, sir. Yeah, I didn't even pay him to say that. Right. <laughs> yes. 
I mean, I think actually in our, in our previous session we were talking about, I think there's a tug of war. I think that you guys are able to see the content in the devices and that helps to inform. But now some of this is data, not content, right? So like, what do we do with the data and how do we manage right. the Right, and the data? technology definitely limits. So, so the beauty of the data visualization is that these data sets are enormous and the detail, you know, it, it is, is mind-blowingly impressive. Um, and so to create content for the dome, let's say, some of those frames take like three hours to render. So we're working on real-time, you know, an original, newly built real-time platform in order to render them fast enough to have interactivity. But when we're working in Unity, um, we've got to diminish those, you know, crunch down those data sets to such an extent that you got to kind of stop and wonder, like, do we need to use CAT scan data or can't we just, like, buy a toy at a store and sort of, you know, Why model it from that? Because the amount of detail um, is going to limit your interaction. So then you're weighing the amount of detail and the beauty of the model versus the level of interactivity. And so there are definite trade-offs, but it's, you know, exponential improvement. So by the time we figure out mm -hmm. how to create an experience that's mind-blowing and fun and educational, hopefully the technology will have arrived um, and we'll be ready to take advantage of it. Yeah. Although there's an aspect of open space that is dynamically loading in data sets of higher and higher resolution as you get closer. So theoretically, you could eventually just do that, dig deeper and deeper and find the detail where you right. need Right, so it. only render the field of view that yeah. you're looking at at any one time. Speak for yourself. <laughs> but like it's probably fine to like yeah. look up look, walk around, look right. up, look, walk around. Um, or one we had one of those kind of emerge with with dominant form. It seems like the glasses will take a while to be ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. I, I they definitely will be. Uh, I will tell you a about a, a little bit of exper an experiment we did that I think um, says a lot. So we had a, a data set of nearby stars. So it's a three-dimensional atlas of nearby stars, um, and we use that in our tours of the universe. And one of the cool things about it is, you know, if the viewer is situated on Earth looking at that 3D data set, we can outline the constellations and it's all very familiar. And then as soon as you s start to fly out, the constellations distort. And suddenly there's this revelation like, oh my God, the stars are not coplanar. Space is 3D. <laughs> um, so we put that data set and that experience onto a tango um, and sent it out into our hall of the universe. And because we have some panels that the constellations are etched in. So it was, you look at the panel, you see the constellation, and then as you move through <coughs> the hall, you see it stretch. And I was like, this is a no brainer. People are gonna love this. And you, they had no idea what was going on. And then we did the same thing in the hollow lens. And I have to assume it's because it's three dimensional, you're actually in 3D space in the hollow lens. They understood what was happening like right away. So I think, you know, phones are always gonna be really useful to overlay information on, um, to overlay graphics. But I think if we're really talking about exploring three dimensional data sets, uh, we're gonna have to wait for those other devices. We're three minutes over, but I, I, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. We had no backlash. We we did let children use it. Um, well these are supervised. These, these are short experiences. Um, I can tell you heights. Seven, eight years old. Um, the only challenge that we had was the weight of some of the headsets on the small head. So I think the uh, the caution with children is more with virtual reality than with the augmented reality headset. I mean, my fear would be that they drop the one HoloLens that we have, which is 2500 $2, bucks, and we don't have another one. But um, I guess we can hang out for questions if you guys want to talk, uh, whatever. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>